chapter 16. Go ahead and take your chairs. Thank you, worship team. And it reads, I'm going to read the first part, Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. I started this message last Sunday. And it reads there, Sarai, Abram's wife, hadn't yet produced a child. Father, we, we thank you for the faith that is present in this church. We thank you for the promises that you've given us, Lord God. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us things that we should and shouldn't do, things we should avoid as we follow you to all truth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So again, like last week, I want you to think of some of the stupid things you did when you were desperate, right? Again, when you were desperate. Not when you were thinking about it and you had it all strategy, but when you were desperate. And I can really, if you think about it, look around, you can only imagine some of the stories. If my story is any kind of representation of what your story might have been, we've had some pretty unique times. Amen? Many believers, their behaviors and their morals, and, and I hate to say this, Monday through Saturday are no different than the non-believers. Can somebody say, ouch? I began last week talking about four things believers need to avoid. Or four things believers do that mess up their lives. Right? And here, I'm using the story as a backdrop, Abram and Sarai. And it said that Sarai, Abram's wife, hadn't had produced a child yet. And her inability to conceive a child caused her and Abram to do some very dumb things. Well, the first thing we talked about last week was, uh, and, and the first thing a believer needs to avoid is, do not let fleshly desire overrule good sense. And here was her plan. If you remember the story, she had an Egyptian maid named Hagar. And Sarah said to Abraham, God has not seen fit to let me have a child. Sleep with my maid. Maybe I can get a family from her. So Sarah, Abram's wife, took her Egyptian maid, Hagar, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. Abram had been living 10 years in Canaan when this took place. Now, when you, first, when you read it right away, first of all, what kind of a woman would give another woman to her husband? Not in this day and age, right? I said, if that happened nowadays, husbands, don't go to sleep because you're not waking up. Amen? That just doesn't happen. It was a dumb thing, but it was her plan because she wanted a child. The flesh, the old mankind, the sinful nature caused her to do something that normally no one would do. See, the struggle can be directly related to the sin of the sinful nature. 2 Peter 2.17 reads like this. These men are springs without water. Mist driven by a storm, blackest darkness are reserved for them. For there they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in air. So this is what we're, we're faced nowadays. And no one sets aside the word of God without consequence. Because people will come and give you good ideas, great ideas, but I tell everybody, uh, it may sound good, but if it does not align with the gospel and the, and the Bible, don't listen to it. I don't care how good it is. And what happens, right, when we're desperate, anything can happen. You know, when you're desperate, you might even spend $2,000 that you are going to send the men's home to a retreat when you're desperate. So we all get tested at different areas, but you got to stay true with, with, first of all, what the Holy Spirit told you to do, and secondly, what, what, what the Bible tells you to do. you got to stay true to it. And if we do, God will honor it. Amen. Come on, say amen, right? Amen. Galatians 6, 7, again, I'm trying to give you a review of last week. It says there, don't be misled. Remember that you can't ignore God and get away with it. You will always reap what you sow. 
Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desire will have as a consequence of decay and death. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So don't let your fleshly desires make you do bad decisions. The second thing we talked about last week was uh, that a believer needs to avoid. Do not listen to those who are unfamiliar with the Word of God. A Christian should never get counsel from somebody who's not in church or at least is not serving the Lord. What can the world, what type of counsel will the world give a believer? And uh, we've had people, you know, well, you know, they go to a secular doctor and because they have them, you know, uh, stress or whatever, and the doctor gives them Prozac and all this other stuff. You know, they, oh, but the doctor gave it to me. Might as well smoke a joint. Might as well go, go, go do some cocaine. What's the difference? None. See, people will give you counsel that is not godly. The Bible doesn't say that. If you're going through trials, guess what? Pray. You're under pressure? Pray some more. You need help? Pray. You're depressed? Don't get up until you're not depressed. Pray. Get a hold of God. You ought to be amazed at what happens when an individual comes in encounter with the creator of heaven and the earth. Be amazed. Can you tell me that God who created everything can't fix our problem? Uh, no, you have to st- keep your, your, your counsel with those who understand what the word of God says. Genesis 16, 2, let's keep reading. Abram, here's Abram. Abram agreed to do what Sarai said. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took her Egyptian maid, Hagar, and gave her to her husband. Again, you got to understand, it said, Abram agreed. He slept with her, she got pregnant. Verse 4, when she learned she was pregnant, she looked down at her mistress. See, what happened? Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. See, spiritual people need spiritual advice. Not, that sounds good. Now, Abraham, you can imagine Abraham, 80 years old. His wife's probably 70, right? And, he, and he, she offers him a young 30-year-old. That guy was so deep in the flesh, he didn't know what he was thinking. He said, well, sure, amen? Or, oh, my, I shouldn't say amen. Huh? He listened to her. Psalms 1-1 reads, how blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. See, Abram chose to sin. Ab- again, Abraham or Abram chose to sin. Sarah followed her nature. There's a difference. Sarah was just being Sarah. Abraham chose to sin. Why? Because Abr- God told Abraham what to do. He said, You're, I'm going to give you some." God spoke to Abram. God didn't speak to Sarah. What, she, what Sarah heard, she heard from Abraham. So Abram directly sinned against God. And we pick up the story here. The third thing believers need to avoid. Do not blame others for things you bring upon yourself. Don't blame others. Genesis 64, again, he slept with Hagar and she got pregnant. When she learned she was pregnant, she looked down on her mistress. That word despise or, or look down, in the original language, it carries a connotation of, of, of taking something lightly. She took her lightly. Or she belittled her like, oh, who are you? And you can imagine, she's younger, right? See, suddenly, in Hagar's eyes, her mistress uh, uh, no longer respected her. Rather, let me say it again. Suddenly, in Hagar's eyes, she did not respect Sarai. She lost some of the honor, I'm talking about Sarai, uh, as she had before. Why? Because Hagar is elevated from the position of slave. Remember, she was a slave to second wife. She was elevated up. In two things, she now considers herself even better than the first wife. I may be the second wife, but at least I still got a figure. I'm younger. And I can have babies and you can't. Who's your daddy now? So she might even believe that she she could supplant Sarah in Abram's heart. So in Sarah's imaginations, that wasn't the way it was supposed to work out. Remember, Sarah, I can't have a baby, so she had a plan. So she probably pictured this great plan. She can have a baby, and that little baby will run into my arms. 
me, right? Oh, beautiful. In her mind, it would work out great. And then Abraham would even love me more because now I gave her a child. But she forgot one thing. There was another woman there. Hello, someone. It's hard with one woman in the house. You put two, you're asking for a lot of trouble. Amen? The minister said, oh, my. The women, you still like me? No, her vain imagination, she saw uh, something uh, that was not going to happen. And, and Hagar, her slave, taking care of the, the house while she played with her baby. She forgot Hagar was a woman. And one thing I've seen over the years, when one resorts to trusting schemes of the flesh, your scheme never turns out like you expected. Well, I'll do this, and I'll do this, and I'll do this. Well, you can do all that. But if God is not leading you and it's your scheme because you want to get your way, I'm going to manipulate. If I do this, I'll move here, I'll go there, I'll do that, I'll call him. I mean, you're manipulating everything, go your way. It never seems to work out just the way you planned it. Amen? Or is that just me? So that's why I stopped planning my way. I don't go, no, no, I ain't planning nothing. God, if you're not in it, I don't want to do it. Huh? I'm going to stick to what you call me to do. Huh? See, when one loses faith, in the promises God, in the promise that God gives, life gets hard. You got to understand, Abram was given a promise. He had this promise in his heart. When his wife came to him with this idea, he should have said, what's wrong with you, woman? Are you crazy? Right? No, but in Sarah's case, she was humbled. Her attempt to make things happen, what happened was she went into competition with a younger woman. And let's face it, you know, women, I, I've learned this over the years. When you put two women in a room with one objective, they compete. They don't quite compete like men, but they compete. Ain't that right, ladies? You know how you get it. You can bring another woman. Oh, okay. You be checking everything out. <laughs> you make sure. Right? Oh, come on. Don't act like, no, not me. Yeah. Women, if you put two women in a house, only one woman can own the kitchen. Well, right? No, well, I, want, I want blue. Well, I, I want pink. Well, I, want blue. I mean, you, you can't share. Women cannot share a kitchen. So if they can't share a kitchen, there's no way they're going to share Abram. Right? So she was humbled. And she's competing with a younger woman. Right? You can't. Look, a, you know, beauty is fleeting. I, and I, and I feel, this is where I feel uh, um, some empathy for ladies. Right? Because... When, we, when men get old, we just get old. We don't really care about it. We're just old. But when women get old, they, they're, all of a sudden they begin to look at themselves and their, their beauty is fleeting because they used to be pretty and, and all the guys were looking at them. Then, you know, 40 comes, they'll go, maybe not as many guys are looking at me or I'm not a, as attractive as I used to be. You know, come on, ladies. And then you hit 50 and you go, oh, man, I got more wrinkles than, than, than the highways in Denver. I mean, you know, you know then you get 60. And I was like, whoa. Cause, and beauty fleets, fleets, fleets. And all of a sudden... In comes this 29-year-old model, dun, 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 right? And she wants to say hi to your husband. Right? And, and the husband, like, dumb, because men are sometimes dumb. We, don't, we ain't catching all that stuff. Women catch it. Ain't that right, ladies? Come on, you can say, mm-hmm. <laughs> and see, that's kind of how dumb Abram was. He should have known better. Right? He's got them. One would think she had no choice but to go and apologize to Abraham for her ill-fated suggestion. You know, she should have went to Abraham, I, I should have never done this, right? You would think she'd come to her senses. Wrong. You know what happened? Like it always happens. She blamed Abraham. Man, things never, some things just never change, huh? Genesis 16, verse 8. 16, verse 5. Sarah told Abram, it's all your fault. <laughs> it wasn't his idea. He just went along with it. It's your fault I'm suffering this abuse. I put my maid in your bed with you, and in the minute she knows she's pregnant, she treats me like I'm nothing. May God decide which of us is right. She blamed Abraham because of her, her decision. So you can't be blaming other people when you do something wrong. When you planned it, it's not, oh, he did it. It was, it was he, she did. No, 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 no. You planned this. You tried to do it. See, these are the things we have to avoid. We have to take responsibility for our own actions. And she, she didn't do that. 
Uh, uh, the, 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 this third ill-advised thing that believers do is a common occurrence. I see it all the time. People will, will do things outside of God's will, and oh, hell will break loose. They'll come, Pastor, pray for me. And I, I feel like, I, you know, my prayer ain't going to help because you got to reap what you sold. You did this. I, I didn't do it, but, you know, but, 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 no, no, don't, don't, don't but, 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 but. You better just get on your knees and pray, hang on tight, and it'll blow by. But you got to hang on and go through it now, sister, brother. You did this. But I wouldn't have done it if she hadn't done that. I wouldn't. No, 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 no. You did this. Hello. See, even when the chickens come home to roost. You ever heard that? Chickens coming home to roost, right? Uh, the, the, the person who, who does the wrong does not accept responsibility. It's not me. It's them. Life would be good if it wasn't for you. Hmm? I learned when you, if you have an issue. I, I look at a person's life. And, and some people have issues. They keep having the same issue over and over and over. You ever meet like, people like that? They, they have an issue here. Then, they, then the next week they have another issue here. It's kind of like the same issue. Then the next week they're over here. They have another issue. Then they have another issue. It, all of a sudden you're going to realize that the problem is following the person. And why? Because the person never takes responsibility for what they do. It's always them. It's them. And you and her, my wife, God, thy, that woman you gave me. Huh? No, we have to take responsibility for who we are. The sign, a sign of spiritual immaturity is blaming others when you are to blame. Matthew 7, 5, read, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your, own, your brother's eye. See, when one refuses to accept responsibility for their mistake, they're destined to repeat them. And some never learn. They stagger the way through life from one crisis to the next. These are often what, what we call the battered and bruised. It never occurs that they hold the key to changing things. That they, can, they can't change because they're too proud to admit they're wrong. But that's the key. You need to admit, you, I have to change. But what we get, the wife blames the husband. The husband blames the wife. Sarah blamed her, Abraham. The husband goes back and forth, back and forth. And really, who cares who started? Who cares who's wrong? Don't you just want a solution? See, if you care more about who's right and wrong, you will never have a solution. To those who want a solution, don't, are not concerned with being right or wrong. How can we fix this? That's what Adam did. Blamed Eve. The kids sometimes even blame the parents. Listen, if you're a young kid, maybe early 20s, okay, you, your, your parents could affect you. Yeah, okay. But if you're past 30, shut up. Can I do it like that? It's on you now. You can, Don't blame mom, mama, my daddy. Oh, I wasn't bottle broken correctly and my daddy spanked me. You're grown up. You got a full beer. You walk, stop already. Stop already. It's all you. You're a grown-up now. You have to take responsibility for your life. Can I say that? Amen. The fourth thing, coming in for land and final thing, believers need to avoid. Do not shirk responsibility for the sake of keeping the peace. See, Abraham at this juncture should have taken charge. You know, he was the man, right? He should have shared the word of God with his bickering wife and Herod, his family. No. After all, he's the patriarch, right? He's in charge. He should have started with himself first, admitting four things. He should have looked at himself. That's where you always start. When you want a solution, you first begin with you. This way. Start with yourself. He should have said, this whole thing started because I let it happen. I didn't have to consent to this fleshly scheme. What I did was wrong, and I need to forgive. I need you to forgive me for my foolishness. That's where Abraham should have started. Amen? Then as the man of the house, after he was convincing enough and believed enough, then as the man of the house, he should have done two important things. He should have rebuked Sarah 
It was your suggestion to, in the beginning. You brought it upon yourself. Stop pointing the fingers of blame. And you should have considered how Hagar would have acted when one of was done. And after he rebuked her, he should have went to the other one and rebuked Hagar. You need to get off your high horse. Remember that you were a servant when my wife lifted you up. You need to treat Sarah with respect. But no. Did he do any of that? No. Abram did nothing to administer righteousness. Huh? Sorting out responsibility. He should have ordered, uh, have ordered uh, those in his home to assume their responsibility. One writer said this of Abram. He was more of a pushover than a patriarch. In Genesis 16, 6, what does Abraham do? Instead of taking charge, he says to, to his wife, your maid is your business. He says, you handle it. And I, I believe that is the spirit of this millennial age. Men do not know how to be men. And all of a sudden, when they want their way, then all of a sudden they want to act like a man. You better act like a man all the time. Don't, don't act like a boy. Then one day turn on the man switch. Today I'm a man. Bling. No, 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 no. If you're going to be a man, you need to be a man all the time. It's, very, it's, it's unfair for a woman to have to, to take care of a little boy, and all of a sudden the little boy turns on the man switch and wants to be a man. If you want to be a man, you better start now. And now, you, now because because your, your your wife or your won't don't believe you're a man, you're gonna have to prove it. So it may take a decade. It may. I'm telling you because women don't forget. Boy, you did something to them. You know. Uh, remember when you did that? Did what? Yeah, you know, 1976, 4:30 p.m. No, what what I do? What I do? And now you bring it up, and the emotion comes back. She's mad at you again. Ah! I go, wait, 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 wait. That happened 30 years ago. I'm sorry. But no, men want to, well, that was last week. Let's stop. Can we lovey-dovey? Shut up, dude. You better start acting like a man. Be respectful, honor, cherish your wife. Cherish, respect, honor, and start doing it consistently for a while. Because it's unfair for you to act like a boy and all of a sudden want to turn on the man switch. Can I move on? The men are saying, Hurry. Get out of there. Huh? See, Abraham relinquished his manhood. So he didn't want to rock the boat. He played dumb. You know, you know what I mean, wives? The way he looks when you, get, when you bust him. He played dumb. Do whatever you think is right, dear. He didn't want to deal with two bickering women. Huh? For Abraham, it was much easier to be a mouse than a man. So someone has to be the spiritual lead. The spiritual head. I'm not suggesting that we men turn over and turn into screaming tyrants. No, no, no. If that is what one has done in the past, that's why you have no respect now. Oh, you have to learn how to act. What I'm referring to is righteous judgment. That's why I love the Bible. You know, you know why I it's my protection. So we'll get into debates, me and my wife. And, you know, she can argue anything. She can argue all you want. But I got the ace in the hole. Oh, yeah? Instead of arguing, what does Scripture tell us? Let's read this, dear. And when I show it to you, don't get mad at me. It says it right there. Get mad at God. Thank you, Lord. You saved me again. <laughs> saved me from my lifestyle, and you saved me from my wife. Hallelujah. <laughs> I have the Word of God as my protector. That's why... But on the other side, I don't get out of acting outside of the Word of God. The Word of God tells a, a man how to be a man, a husband how to be a husband, how not to talk, how, how, how to be. So I have to, just like as I hold her accountable to what the Word of God says, I have to hold myself accountable first. And because I do that, she honors and she respects when I, when I, when I show her. Amen? The righteous judgment, using God's word correctly. See, one who knows what God wants done to administer peace and justice in his home. See, a person that is out front leading by his own example. A Christian that starts with his personal assumption of, of his blame first. Not, see, most people, when they get in an argument, they always start with the assumption that they're wrong. When I get in an argument and somebody gets mad at me, I start with the assumption, what did I do? 
I always start, what did I do? And I look at that and I try to figure out what I did. How did this get like this? What did I do? And if I can't find it, like, okay, if I didn't do anything, then what's really going on? Then I, have, then I begin to ask, what is happening? Is it a spiritual attack? What is going on? But if I don't clear the air with what I did, then everything else I do is muddied and unclear. Because I'm looking through a glass of I did nothing wrong. And if we think we can go on this world thinking we did nothing wrong, we're not just blind, we're stupid. Ooh, I just, did I say that? That sounded mean. Huh? No, no. See, we have to be lead by example. Husbands are supposed to be the heads of their home. Husbands are supposed to be the heads of their home, not the headache of their home. I like that. That sounded good, huh? Can I, I think, I, ladies, you guys like me now, huh? Amen? Praise the Lord. That's right. See, some of the telltale signs of a husband not in his position. See, when I want to know how a guy is doing, it's very simple. See, there's a telltale sign that the husband is not where he's supposed to be. First, their wives are frustrated. I look at the woman. A frustrated woman means the husband doesn't know how to act. Then the husband says, well, it's her fault. It might be her fault. But if you're a good husband, you'd be able to correct that. You'd be able to minister to that. You'd be able to help that. You'd be able to, to, to change the situation. Yeah. That's a fact, Jack. Huh? And I don't care who's right or wrong. Let's assume she's wrong, even if she's wrong. If you're a husband and you live in understanding, you can fix that. Why? Because God, you're the head, and God will give you the insight into how to calm the situation, not exasperated, frustrated. Second thing you can tell the kids are exasperated. Look at the kids. The wife's frustrated and the kids are all, all messed up. James Dawson used to always say, right, if the kids are all messed up, treat the parents until they get better. Well, you look at the kids. The third thing, when I look at a husband, they're overly passive. Just kick you back. Oh, it's cool. They're overly passive. They just let, let allow anything to happen. Dude, wake up. Hello, the house is burning. Oh, it's okay. My wife will get it. <laughs> hey, man, come on. Something happened. The, the, the kids are running around. Oh, it's okay. My wife will go out there and get it. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, I got to watch TV. Game's on. Got to watch the Broncos lose. <laughs> Hello, someone. Ah. No. See, until someone misplaces the newspaper or the TV remote, the husbands don't say nothing. Huh? There's no, there's no spiritual fire. See, we have to be men where there's fire, spiritual fire in our lives. In the spiritual realm, uh, these kind of people are mites, not men. We have to be spiritual men. I don't know why I'm picking on the men today. There's a reason, amen. Huh? Verse 6. Sarah was abusive to Hagar, and she ran away. So what did he say? He goes, you handle it. Abram, check, I'm coming in for landing. You handle it. So what did, what did Sarah do? She, come on. If you give a woman the right to go mess with another woman, that's like going to the carnival. She went after him. She got him, right? Because Abram's lack of leadership began to break up the home. The one fleeing was Hagar. She takes off. And see, that was not God's will. If Abraham would have took the time to pray, he would have said, I need to fix this. But he didn't. So she runs, and for the second time, the Bible says that she took off, and an angel of God found Hagar beside a spring in the desert. And what he says is, look, you need to go back. You're going to go back, and you're going to submit to that woman, right? And you're going to do everything she says, but I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you for what you're going through. I'm going to bless your children, and you will have multiple, multiple children. You'll have generations of children, multitudes. Why? Because if you go back further, Abraham told, um, God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a promise. Your children will be like this. He gave Abraham a promise. Even when they moved in the flesh, God had to honor the promise. So the promise, by default, went to Hagar. Because I gave Abraham a promise. Now get back home, and I'm going to give you more children, and your children are going to be like multitudes. Huh? Descendants. Out of Hagar came Ishmael, the son she was carrying in her womb. And God said, but, but, 
Because it was conceived in rebellion and disobedience, he says, your son will be a wild donkey of a man. Could you imagine God saying, your son is going to be a wild donkey? Oh, that's heavy, dude. It says he would be against everyone, and everyone would be against him. Ishmael, all the children, but this is the result of Abraham and Sarah. But because you got you flesh monsters, disobedient, this is what's going to happen. And because of that one act of disobedience, generations of children, Christian and Jews, are tormented by a wild donkey. So don't think what you do don't matter. Oh, we don't know. We don't know what your disobedience and sin will accomplish. Maybe, and, and, if, and if you're lucky, if you call it luck, it might not happen in your lifetime. But listen, it is going to happen. So all we can do is fall on the grace of God, mercy of God. Say, God, help me. I blew it. Repent. And maybe God can adjust it. But the unrest that we're seeing in the Middle East today is the fruit of Abram's and Sarai's disobedience. Huh? As I close... These four things that people do to mess up their lives don't have to be so common among us. We just need to listen. Can I say that again? I tell people all the time, if we pay attention enough, people tell themselves, all you got to do is listen. Proverbs 120 says this, wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. On the top of wall, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks. Verse 22, how long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? See, the two key words are is simple. That means silly, foolish, or even worse, easily seduced. But the strange thing it says, how long will those who like to be Easily seduced, remain easily seduced. See, when we're when we're simple and we're e- the human nature, you don't fight seduction. You're like Rick James. Give it to me, baby. Give it to me, baby. Right, you're right there. People like to be seduced. Seduce me. Talk to me. Make me feel cheap. Hmm? And he says, how long will you simple people remain simple? You don't have to be that way. All you have to do is listen. It says wisdom is all over. Right? In the streets, in the markets, on top of walls, at the entrance, at gates. It's, wisdom is everywhere. But we like to be seduced. Simplicity. Scoffers. He goes, how long will scoffers delight in scoffing? That word scoffering means to be uh, scornful or mocking or ridiculing. See, if we listen, we can get it right. So four things we need to be careful of. Don't let desperate fleshy desires overrule your good sense. Don't get your counsel from those who don't know the word of God. Don't blame others for things you have brought upon yourself. And don't shirk responsibility. For the sake of keeping peace. That's why the psalmist writes, in Psalms 1, Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He said, if we do that, it declares that we're like a tree planted by streams of water that will yield fruit in season and its leaves will not wither. And I like the last part. And in all you do, you will prosper. We have to seek out wisdom and stay away from those foolish things that I described. I want every head bowed and every eye closed.